I want to talk today about the coherence theory of truth. The coherence theory is relatively recent to the philosophical scene. Throughout the history of philosophy, most philosophers who have reflected on the nature of truth have been correspondence theorists. They've said that something is true if and only if it tells us the way the world is, and so a sentence is true if and only if it corresponds to a fact, or it maps onto the world in a structure-preserving way. It depicts the way things are, and so they've thought in terms of something like correspondence, or a picture theory, or a structure-preserving function that takes us from language to the world, maybe from thought to the world as well. I want to think about things in a slightly different way, though, because we might think that's not the right approach for a variety of reasons, but we might try to take a different perspective. Francis Herbert Bradley, often called F.H. Bradley for short, was a British philosopher around the turn of the century who developed a comprehensive idealistic theory and put forward a coherence theory of truth. The coherence theory breaks away from this talk of facts or structure-preserving functions or pictures, and instead says that language is doing something different, and we have to evaluate claims about truth in a different way. Why? Well, we'll see his reasons in a moment. Basically, he is highly suspicious of this talk of picturing, of a talk of a structure-preserving function, or talk of something like correspondence to a fact. In fact, he denounces facts as vicious abstractions. And here is what he says instead. A sentence is true if it coheres with a comprehensive theory of the world. Now, at first glance, that's a rather strange thing. You might think a comprehensive theory of the world, well, <laughs> there could be many comprehensive theories of the world, and some of them are a lot better than others, so you might worry that this is going to destroy the notion of truth altogether. And indeed, that's an objection that's been made against the coherence theory of truth. But Bradley has in mind something that is truly comprehensive, including not only all of my experiences of the world, but all of our experiences of the world. And maybe not just up to now, but in general throughout the full, fullness of time. And so if you think of it that way, you might think of a comprehensive theory as a theory that really is a theory of everything, not just in the sense of the physicists who want a theory that explains all the fundamental forces of the universe, for example, but that really explains everything, everything from the success of the 1927 Yankees to the weak force in physics, to the existence of dark matter, to the beauty of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, to, all, well, anything you think of, right? Anything about the world, it explains that. And so think about a comprehensive theory that basically tells us everything that coheres with our experience in any way at all. Well, to be true is to be part of, or to be at least coherent with that theory. And when we think of truth that way and realize by comprehensive, Bradley means comprehensive with a capital C, then it retains a bit more plausibility. Still, you might worry that that doesn't pin down the concept of truth. Maybe all of our experiences taken together, even those of every human being throughout the entire stretch of time, past, present, and future, would nevertheless leave open some possibilities and might lead us, in fact, to false beliefs about the world. So, we should think carefully about the coherence theory and what it really amounts to. In order to do that, let's think about Bradley's reasons for maintaining the coherence theory and for moving away from the correspondence theory of truth. He does think of facts as vicious abstractions, as the imaginary creatures of a false theory. He says they're manufactured by a mind which abstracts one aspect of the concrete, known whole, and sets this abstracted aspect out by itself as a real thing. Here we can contrast two basic approaches to philosophy. One you might think of as atomistic or analytic. It tries to explain the meanings of wholes in terms of the meanings of parts. In general, the analytic method, or the atomistic method, looks at complexes and tries to divide them up into their simple components. It tries to say, I can understand the complex by understanding the components, the ways in which they're put together, the ways in which they relate to each other. So I understand wholes in terms of parts. The holist, or functionalist in contrast, says that's the wrong way to do it. I understand parts 
by understanding the wholes that they're parts of. I understand the meaning of a part in terms of its function in the whole. I understand parts in general by referring to the wholes they're parts of and trying to understand the structure and the functioning of the whole thing. So let's think about a shortstop, for example, in baseball. What is a shortstop? Well, it won't help me to look inside the parts of the shortstop to figure out what makes that person a shortstop. I have to look at the function of that player in the game. Let's shift to a different sport and think about the function of a quarterback, or the function of a power forward, or the function of a point guard, or the function of a goalie. All of these have to be understood in terms of their role in a larger picture. I'm understanding the part there in terms of the whole and its function in that whole. I can't look inside the goalie or inside the power forward or the point guard or the shortstop or the quarterback and find out what's going on with quarterbacks or shortstops, etc., etc. And so that's the kind of thing I need to explain by understanding its role, its function in a larger whole. The same thing is true of parts of the body. What is a heart? It's something that pumps blood. I have to understand the function of a heart in a larger system. Understanding the parts of the heart, that's important for understanding the heart and how it fulfills that function. But I can't understand hearts simply by looking inside at the parts of the heart. I have to think about what it's doing within a body. So the atomist or the analyst says, explain the wholes in terms of parts. The wholest or the functionalist talks about understanding the parts in terms of understanding the whole. Now let's apply this to the theory of truth. Bradley is a holist. He says, I have to understand the whole of a theory together. So let's take a look at a couple of examples that I used in motivating the correspondence theory. Snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. Can I simply look at the parts? Snow, white, and so forth. Bradley will say snow. Okay, first of all, let's take that. In order to understand what snow is, is it enough to say, hmm, I can isolate that all by itself? No, often it seems as if I can. In understanding what the word snow means, it's not that I look at the parts instead of, in the sense of looking at the various phonemes or the various letters that comprise it. It's not that. But instead you might think, look, I just look directly at what snow is, what it corresponds to in the world. But Bradley would say, well, wait a minute, we have an entire framework. So I have to understand snow in relation to various other things, in relation to freezing rain, for example, or sleet, or other kinds of precipitation. I have to understand snow in a way that puts it into a certain category of concepts that we use for dividing up forms of precipitation. The same thing is true, more obviously, with white. We have a certain understanding of colors, and we understand a certain region as white. But it's not that simple. Think about a color wheel or think about a, the way a computer generates things or even better yet, pick up one of those booklets in some paint store or a hardware store of various paint colors. Often there's one that says whites and you pick it up and you see this vast array of things, all of which are called white. And then you pick up something that is called neutrals and you look at those. Why is this beige and not a kind of white? Um, this light beige looks a lot like that colonial white, and and this mint green looks a lot like that white. And in short, you think, well, what are the boundaries of what we call white here? This is complicated. What does white mean? Well, we have to understand its role in a system of classifying colors. We have to understand, in a larger sort of system of color terms, what white corresponds to. I can't simply say, ah, the word white corresponds to the quality white and treat that as if it's a simple relationship. That quality we call white, if you want to isolate it and think of it that way, is really something we abstract from a more complicated system by thinking of a certain region within a larger system of color terms. So Bradley thinks that I have to understand the structure of language and what a certain area of language, at the very least, is doing before I can understand the role of any given term in it. And that becomes obvious if we look cross-culturally and look at the different ways in which different cultures divide up the color spectrum, for example. Or even among people, they will divide it up in different ways. There's a boundary between blue and green, for example. Where do you draw that line? 
Where do we say that's a shade of blue? Where do we say that's a shade of green? Where in the middle do we just say, well, it's kind of both, it's turquoise or aqua or something like that? I know from experience, my wife and I tend to draw the line in that particular space in the color spectrum in different ways. So we don't have to think about remote cultures here. We can just think about the culture of the other person living in the house to realize, yeah, we don't exactly agree about where some of these boundaries are. We have to think about this in terms of a larger scheme, not just in terms of picking out one thing in the world, and the role that it plays in that larger scheme of classification. This becomes even more obvious when we think about scientific terms. Let's think about something like, oh, <laughs> a claim of physics, something that is slightly different between, for example, Einstein's theory and Newton's theory. Suppose I say, for example, that momentum is mass times velocity. There's a sense in which Newton and Einstein agree about that, and another sense in which they don't. Both are going to write down a statement that looks basically the same, P equals mv. But what they mean by mass is a little bit different there. Newton has one concept of mass. It doesn't matter to the mass of the thing whether it's stationary or in motion. The mass is the mass, that's it. Einstein distinguishes between rest mass and inertial mass. And in that case, once we've drawn that distinction, all of a sudden that statement that momentum is mass times velocity becomes ambiguous. Are we referring to rest mass or inertial mass? And so there it's important that we have in mind inertial mass. If I mean rest mass, then that statement is false. So when we think about a statement like, hey, momentum is mass times velocity, we realize that A, from Einstein's point of view, that's ambiguous. But B, to evaluate a claim like that, I have to think what role are terms like momentum, mass, velocity, playing in your system. I have to understand the larger picture and what you're assuming about these various things to have some idea of whether to evaluate that claim as true or false. So I can't simply say, ah, look for the fact in the world, or let's look at what this corresponds to, that corresponds to, and so on. I have to think, hmm, mass, what does that mean for you? I don't just trace it to something in the world. Instead, I say, what role is that playing in your theory of the world? This is a situation that often arises when we're dealing with scientific terms. We have to understand the role they're playing in the theory. And once we do that, we realize that it's highly sensitive to the larger shape of the theory. We have to think about the role or the function of that term in the whole in order to understand what it's saying in a given sentence or the meaning of that sentence, and to, so to evaluate that as true or false. Those, you might say, are some of the positive arguments that Bradley makes, but they're also important negative arguments, and the most famous one is called Bradley's regress. It is in part an attack on Platonism, but it's also something that is directed against the correspondence theory. And we can put it this way. Think about something like this Russellian idea that a sentence is true if and only if there is a corresponding fact. So snow is white is true if and only if there is a fact that snow is white. Now, facts are vicious abstractions, Bradley says. Why? Well, he says, yeah, we can think about that. And so let's say, <laughs> I think of that in terms of a sentence. It's a fact, or there's a fact, that snow is white. Now he says, really, you've just given me another sentence. I've said snow is white is true, if and only if snow is white. Under what circumstances is snow white? You've said, well, if there's a fact that snow is white. Now I say, well, what makes it true that it's a fact that snow is white? You say, well, it's, now what? <laughs> what do I say? It looks like I should say, well, it's a fact that it's a fact that snow is white. Um, what makes that true? I guess it's a fact that it's a fact that it's a fact that snow is white. And so on. So all of a sudden it looks like, well, if I say, hmm, what makes snow is white true? There is a fact that snow is white. What makes that true? There's a fact that there's a fact that snow is white. And so I keep getting there's a fact that, or it's a fact that, and I just keep going. Right? I have to add that on. So there's a sense in which there's something strange Bradley is saying about the correspondence theory. It says the statement is true if there's a fact. But all you've done is get me another sentence, right? You've said there's a fact 
that snow is white. I said, well, you just said another sentence. What makes that true? You could just try stopping there and say, well, there is a fact that snow is white. But it looks like to be consistent, you should say there's a fact that there's a fact that snow is white. What makes that true? Well, there's a fact that there's a fact that there's a fact that snow is white. And it looks like you keep getting pushed down forever. Now, there's a sense in which this might not be vicious if you simply say, oh, yeah, you can keep tacking on it's true that if snow is white that it's true that snow is white that it's true that it's true that snow is white it's true that it's true that it's true that snow is white and so on that's not so problematic but the problem Bradley says is that in this case you're not just embe embellishing you think this is somehow explanatory you think what makes this true is the fact that snow is white but what makes it true that it's a fact that snow is white there must be a fact that it's a fact that snow is white, and so on. In other words, your very principle of explanation keeps driving you down to further levels where you say, well, yeah, there's a fact. So there's a fact that there's a fact. Oh, there's a fact that there's a fact that there's a fact, and so on. And you're seeking the explanation in what becomes, you probably might have guessed it, turtles all the way down. It looks like now we've got this infinite regress of explanation going. Bradley says, well, you know what happens with infinite regresses? You're in deep trouble and you haven't explained anything unless you can figure out some non-circular way of cutting it off somewhere. But how can you do that? Where can you stop it? It'd be nice to stop it with just the fact. And that's what people like Russell and Wittgenstein try to do. But he says, I don't see why you get to stop there. And if you think you can stop there, why don't we just stop with this? Right? Just say snow is white. What's all this fact business? <laughs> that doesn't do any explaining at all. So in short, Bradley says, I don't see how this kind of account can explain anything from a philosophical point of view. Now, logically, it may be you can tack on, it's a fact that, or there is a fact that, that's fine. You can talk about things in the world here, that's fine. But you're doing that on the basis of language just by using more language. You're never getting outside language to the world in a way that allows you to say you're giving an explanation for what makes something true or why it's true. You're just saying that it's true in different and more complicated words. But actually, these things are true by virtue of snow being white, not the other way around. So Bradley says, this whole idea of looking at things down in the world, toward the world, that, that's, that's a failure. That leads to an infinite regress. Cut it out. Instead, think about the role this plays in a larger web. So instead of having this kind of picture, where we look for some further support that makes something true and end up being led into a regress, Bradley says, think in terms of a web, what Klein calls the web of belief. We might say, in general, we do have connections to the world, we do have experience on the outside of this web, but then we have complicated relations of various terms, various sentences within this web. It's connected to experience in various ways. But if I want to understand a claim like momentum is mass times velocity, or even snow is white, I realize I'm not the edge of that web. I'm pretty far inside somewhere. And when I get to mathematics and physics, I'm very far inside. Philosophy, very far inside. And so how do I understand these claims? I have to understand the roles these play in a larger conceptual system. I can't just think about their direct connections to the world.